benefit as much as possible from the information we have. My view is that, as it is, uh, it is possible now to, um, within a relatively short term, transfer knowledge from these more, uh, you know, resulting from these genomics approaches into the fish farms with benefits. But of course, it requires some, some investment uh, and we can talk about that later on. So uh, I'll start with a few uh, aspects, with general aspects, which um, in fact you probably know better than me. Um, these are some examples of issues in aquaculture. You know, most people want, or well, most farms want to have fish that grow fast, convert their food well, uh, save money, profit, make maximize profits. You don't want parasites or diseases that can destroy your, your farm. You want probably fish that are resistant to them. Um, you know, the, the environmental problems, you, you want some way of minimizing those impacts and so on. So these are questions which in somehow um, these new technologies may be able to help. It's not magic. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the name uh, and, and the kind of lots of uh, publicity behind it sometimes give the idea that, you know, this is going to resolve all the problems of the world. Partly this comes from the biomedical side where every day we hear, you know, we're going to use this latest technology to uh, individually treat people by gene transfer or gene whatever. Uh, and in reality, many of these have not uh, been transformed uh, into practice. There are possibilities, but then biology always uh, puts, brings some new problems. So it's not magic, but it certainly can help. I found this slide, which at least gives the idea, so this is considered, I've got to move into this side, see here. Um, so this is 1996, and you can see it somewhere less here. Uh, this slide, which um, basically suggests that at some point there have been some technological improvements that possibly uh, developments in science. These this, uh, problems that were solved here, actually many of them are kind of environmental. Others have some biology. Um, I think certainly there are what you can call in this meeting biological enhan enhancements, which should be able to improve uh, production. And I found this statement in the Mireille's website. Uh, genetic selection has achieved 35% reduction uh, uh, in production time for seed in eight years. So that means this fish will pass up, uh, and so on. I don't know how real this is, but it's, it's something that certainly is feasible. Uh, there are so, uh, apparently some selection programs. Some of them may have started and disappeared with time, uh, using the old ways of uh, selection. Okay, so this is basically what I'm going to talk about. First of all, I'm going to give you a background, as I said, from basics, uh, and then I'll show you some more uh, advanced aspects and, and talk about some examples of current technologies. So let's start from the beginning. So what's this about genomics? What do you call genomics? Um, genomics is the study of the genomes of organisms in all its complexities. Right, so, uh, what's this genomes? Well, basically, the genome is the, the entire DNA sequence of organisms and the fine scale genetic mapping. It means that we know where the genes are and their position and so on. And it's not just about genes because the DNA is very complex. There are regulatory regions and a series of other aspects which we don't really need to go into much detail here. But it's the analysis of these structures that is genomics, to be, to be able to analyze in detail. Behind that, because the genome is large, you cannot do it like one piece by piece, you know, which would take centuries. It is what we call a high throughput approach. 
it means that we have to tackle it so that we can analyze it globally. Uh, and this is the big difference. All behind all these, these um, approaches nowadays is to be able to look at it on from several points of view at the same time. You know, not analyze one molecule, analyze thousands of molecules at the same time, and understand, try to understand what goes on in the cells globally in the organism, uh, or sometimes even in the ecosystems. That's the objective. It depends on level of the So this is the key aspect, it's high throughput. And so that means it requires resources, technology, to be able to access it. The other uh, aspect is that sometimes it's confused with molecular biology. It's not exactly the same thing, it's part of it, because you're analyzing molecules. Molecular biology deals basically at the molecular level. Uh, but we're not going to distinguish very much, you know, to be very uh, puritanic in a way. We're going to take these things in a general way. So we're not just talking about, you know, the full uh, length of DNA. Sometimes we may be talking about the gene, and people still talk about genomics sometimes. But that, in, in real terms, that's not the case. Shouldn't be the case. So, uh, so this goes to other omics. You probably heard of proteomics, metabolomics, etc. It's the same idea. You look at many molecules at the same time. Uh, so you have the genome, that's the DNA, where the genetic information is stored. The transcriptome, which comes from the DNA, which then is turned into proteins, and we call it the proteome. And of course, the proteins deal with small molecules called metabolites, and we call the metabolome. And these are different techniques to analyze this uh, at different levels. In fact, uh, this technique here, sequencing, can deal and normally deals with both of these nowadays. These microarrays are out of the circulation. Uh, of course, when you talk about analysis, it also means computing capacity and techniques to be able to analyze all this at the same time. If you think of statistics, quite often, you know, you, you, you do a small experiment, you know, two treatments and so on. Here, okay, you may have two treatments, but you're dealing with massive amounts of individuals or more or, or, or molecules. So, how can these approaches inform agriculture? One thing is that you can get uh, ideas of how the whole system is changing, you know, or how it functions. So, we should be able to extract information. And there are some different areas that can be applied. Diseases uh, and vaccines and traceability, for example, in very important aspects nowadays. Uh, the question of the environment, uh, you know, uh, cleaning and so on. Uh, reproduction, you know, it's a very important aspect which I'm going to concentrate more genetic and mark uh, market assisted selection. Uh, I think this is where, when we talk about selection, this is where genomics really is going to have a major impact, and that's what we are most of the time going to talk about. And of course, the basic knowledge to know how the fish actually works in a normal way, independent of whether it's selected or not. So that we are in the knowledge-based economy, that's what we talk nowadays. And without this, innovation is very difficult. So, uh, start from the beginning. Well, you all know about this. Mendelian genetics, uh, when you have uh, you know, simple characters, uh, you, you cross uh, uh, these individuals, you get uh, the F1, where you can get a dominant gene, that's the only thing you see, and then you get, uh, in the next generation, uh, a ratio of 3 to 1. If you have two characters, you get different ratios and so on. And this is to show uh, you know, the, the, the laws of Mendel about segregation and dependent sorts of, of uh, alleles, uh, which nowadays, of course, they are called uh, genes as well, uh, which are responsible for particular traits. And this is the basis of genetics. Uh, and when we talk about DNA and, and, uh, and traits in the DNA, this applies. Now, DNA is a uh, a complex molecule, and I'm going to just remind you what it is like. First of all, it's made up of nucleotides, and nucleotides are are composed of a sugar, 
a phosphate which is charged, it's got a negative charge, and a base. And in fact, most of the time, when we think of nucleotides, we tend to think of the bases. Because the bases give the specificity, gives it the, the code for the DNA. And so when they are linked by the phosphorus, uh, you get this strand, the DNA strand. And in the cell, DNA is uh, a double molecule. It's joined, it's linked by a weak um, bonds. Uh, the two the two strands we have two strands of DNA and uh, so DNA will grow uh, in the cell by addition of nucleotides to build these and it's an helical molecule uh, this is a, a, an interesting aspect because of course the structure of DNA is linked to its properties and why it's so important one is of course it has the genetic code because of these bases. And the second is when it uh, duplicates, it always keeps as template the parent's DNA. So there's a separation and then a new strand forms complemented the first one, which is basically identical, unless something causes an alteration in one of the bases, and you have, then you have mutation. So this is the basis of, of the DNA. What, what's interesting about these properties is related to also to the approaches in genomics, genomics, is that you, for example, can, by using either uh, enzymes or, or even by heating up this molecule, you can break these bonds. Any alteration, or some alterations, better say, in the DNA can be translated into alterations in the protein. And this is uh, quite important because the protein, but because of those alterations, can work better or they can work worse. Uh, and you see that. Now, the properties of DNA. You probably all heard of PCR, it's, it's the polymerase chain reaction. This is a key technique that is used in, in fact, you know, I would say 90% or more of molecular biology applications that deal with nucleic acids. And I'm just going to mention specific what it means. The polymerase chain reaction, so the PCR, why is it so useful? One, because it can copy the DNA, the original DNA, into many copies. And by doing that, you, you can start with a very small quantity and end up with a large quantity and actually be able to see it. So if you want to detect, and you know these kind of applications, a pathogen that is there, you know, maybe one, one, one individual, and you can extract the DNA, and you can amplify it and say, yeah, this is here, it's present. So a, a very sensitive method of of uh, detection. But it also is used as part of the other technology when we talk about. But you know how it works. It's just basically like this. I'll just uh, quickly go through. So this is the machine that is used as an example in machine. And the way it's used is like this. So first, you have the DNA molecule. Like I mentioned before, you heat it up. You separate the DNA. So you have the two strands, like we showed before. But then, to make the DNA to grow and to be replicated, you need small bits of DNA that are complementary to the molecules that are there. You can make that artificial, you can synthesize. And when you put them together at a slightly lower temperature, this is about 95 degrees, they bind. You just link up exactly in the position where they are complementary. And by having that as a starting point, then you use enzymes and the, and the nucleotides and so on. And you then can grow this. So you have a first cycle where you make a copy. 
Then you hit up again this where you have now two copies. You hit it up again, separate, do the same thing, and then you have four copies, eight copies, 16, 32. It's going to duplicate every time. And in about 10 times, depending on the quantity that you have there, you can see it. You start maybe from one or two molecules, and you can see it. So this is the power. You can see it here. And now we have so-called quantitative PCR, qPCR. You may have heard of this or not. I don't know. But what it means is that you can actually, in real time, <coughs> using fluorescence, see on the screen how these molecules are being replicated. And you can use this to quantify, to say, there are so many molecules over there. And this can be used, for example, to quantify how many particles of a virus is in a fish or on a sample. So you can actually say how many there are there from the beginning. So this is just an example of a technique, but very powerful technique, that is the base of many applications, including some that you probably already have heard. But I thought that I will start by giving this kind of basic information, because sometimes you hear about names and you don't know what it means, uh, and that's it. So the other uh, concept is concept of gene. So if you think of the DNA, there are specific regions of the DNA which encode a message, a message for a protein, for example. So that's the gene. So it's using the old Mendelian definitions, a unit of heredity that is transferred from a parent to offspring and is held to determine some characteristics of the offspring. That's what the gene does. But in, no, in modern terms, it's a stretch of DNA that calls for a type of protein or uh, an RNA that has a function in the organism. So there are different kinds of RNAs, as I mentioned before, and I'm not going into details. We may hear about it later on. Now, in vertebrates, the gene is organized like this. So this brown bit is the bit that produces the RNA, which is going to code for the protein. This, some of these proteins can actually bind to the DNA and control the, how fast the RNA is produced, or even just stop production or start production. So this is called the regulatory region of the DNA. And it can be next to the gene or quite far away. It doesn't matter, because the DNA in the cell is completely uh, coiled up. So is these two regions. This is the, the region that includes for the RNA of the protein, and then there are regulations so that it can be controlled. And there are many ways of controlling it. So we don't go into that kind of detail. This is the basic concept. Now, the DNA, to encode for a protein, the proteins are made of amino acids. And so you have the genetic code. The genetic code is composed of three letters, three nucleotides, so three bases. And each one, each group of three, encodes for an amino acid, which is indicated here. As you can see, sometimes there is only one code for one amino acid. Other times you have many codes for one amino acid. And it is important which amino acid uh, corresponds to the code, because amino acids have different properties, all of them. Uh, all these ones that are indicated here, they have different properties. And some of them can change completely the protein, completely. For example, if you have proline, this amino acid, a protein that was a straight, like a, a linear protein, will be bent. As you can imagine, this is not going to function properly. So you just, what's needed to, for example, add a proline? Well, if you, if you compare this code with this code here, this is alanine, an amino acid you've probably heard about because sometimes it's in the packets of food they sell around. Uh, you see, for example, GCG. This is a CCG, very close. You just need to change this G into a C, a mutation, and it starts to control protein. So small change, one, one single nucleotide in the DNA can change, you can see here, you can change these ones, these last ones, and it has still has the same amino acid. Others have 
big, big effects. Earth, Earth is modified slightly, but has also practical implications. For example, imagine uh, hemoglobin, that there was a mutation in one amino acid that improves the binding of oxygen. This can make the fish tolerate better low water, uh, low oxygen in the water. And so this fish will probably, instead of 4.5 <coughs> per million, still grows at 4 per million. So, <coughs> so this is just basic to exemplify what I just said. Many different types of proteins, uh, mutations can change the codons and therefore amino acids, you know, the, the amino acids. And changing one amino acids have a dramatic effect on protein structure and protocol can have an effect. Well, so what kinds of mutations can we have in DNA? Well, they are all very logical. This is the normal, the, the, a normal stretch of DNA, and you've got the amino acids here. You have the so-called silent mutations. That means that if you change it, the nucleotide, nothing happens. You still the same amino acid because of the genetic code. But sometimes you change it for a stop, and that's a nonsense mutation. That means that the protein stops. If it's at the beginning of the, of the sequence of the protein, it means that the rest of the protein is not produced. So that's a terrible thing. Uh, a missense mutation, it changes one amino acid. It may have implications or not, depending on, the, on what kind of amino acid it is. And then there are either deletions, sometimes the nucleotide disappears, and that makes a change, a shift in the frame of reading. So there is, in this case, it's still produce some amino acid, although it's different from, from what's there. It can, be, it can be a deletion, an insertion, sometimes more than that. So these things can happen. Why, how can it happen? You know, by chance, sometimes because of exposure to pollutants or to uh, UV light or whatever. There are many reasons why mutations happen. Some of them happen spontaneously. Okay, as we said before, genomes are the full set of an organism energy information. So where is the genome? It's in the chromosome. As you know, chromosomes, there are different kinds. In humans, this is the example of the human uh, chromosome set. Uh, different shapes, lengths, and so on. In fact, uh, chromosomes are just bits of DNA with protein. And the, sh the, the shape, the length of the chromosome has no importance. Well, that's not completely true. The importance is that's one way of making sure that species don't cross. It's a way of speciation, but making sure, because then they cannot pair if they are completely different. If they are very similar, they can pair when it comes to, uh, to the uh, fecundation and so on. So that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's how it works. So in fact, sometimes, you know, two species, which are very closely related, they can have completely different numbers of chromosomes. One can have like four, the other one can have 20. That's, that can happen. But that's because of that mechanism. Otherwise, it's just not too important. They still function with the, the bits of DNA that are here. Uh, then you have the mechanisms that you know of cell division with mitosis and meiosis. And meiosis is the, is the one that, uh, I don't have a picture here, but you know, uh, where the gametes are produced. Uh, this is what a chromosome looks like in mitosis. They tend to be very condensed, so you can see them like here. Or during so-called interphase, the chromatin, which is the DNA plus the protein, is dispersed. So that means it's kind of spread. When you look on the microscope, you don't see the chromosomes because it's very dispersed. But this is when it's active. This is when the RNA is being produced, it's this phase. When their cells are dividing as, as it's logical, they are not being producing any RNA. It's only the RNAs that are already there that were produced before that may be active. So that's the, the chromosome. And I'm talking about chromosomes because precisely of, uh, I'll mention this further on, during meiosis, there is crossing over. And crossing over, it's the swap of fragments of DNA, of chromosomes, that allows variation also to be introduced. But we'll, we'll come back to that. The other thing I would like to talk just very briefly is model organisms. It's another word that, or a concept that appeared uh, with these uh, new ideas of omics. 
And what are they? Well, they are generally organisms that are easy to work with, that have some particular advantage. And I just give you some examples here. This is a nematode. This nematode became a model organism for neurophysiology because you, every single cell is known. They have about 1,023 or something like that cells. And this, the, the people that work with these animals, they know which one gives rise to that one and to that one and so on and so on. And so this is a very good to work for many problems. And very keep, easy to keep them in the lab and so on. And I could say the same thing for others. You know what the you know the mice is used in particularly in biomedicine as a model for humans uh, disease and so on. Of course, humans themselves are a model, and uh, this is the um, the yeast where you make beer and so on. These are all some kind of simple organisms, but which have been subject to very intensive uh, research. Now their genomes are all known. And so they can play with it, they can transform them, change them, and so on. Now, as I was saying, uh, the importance of meiosis is meiotic recombination. Mm -hmm. What it does is research, reshuffles gene alleles. So if you have, like here, uh, two alleles, and then there is crossing over here, you know, this is what you get at the end after the prophase of the first uh, meiotic division. And which is amplified here with these colors. So the gametes are here. These are two character uh, kind of uh, example in the uh, angle. It's the same thing. So you've got these are the various uh, gametes and then the crossing over. These are similar to the parents somewhere. And some of them are recombinated like this one. So, so this allows recombination. Um, and the other thing that it allows is that if we have markers like these ones that are here, we know what these are. Um, it allows you to calculate the relative distance. Uh, so basically, if you have a segment of, uh, of, 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 a, of a chromosome, the further away, the more separated two markers are, the highest is the probability of crossing over. That's logical. If they are too near, the chances that these three or four nucleotides change around is small. But if you have many, it can happen many times, or it can happen several times. So that's the relationship. The further away they are, the more recombination there is, and that means they are further distant. Uh, so you can you can use that as a relative measure. Um, and this is this measure is, is, is by convention called a centimode. So the percentage of recombination. And it can be the maximum value is about 0.5, uh, so 50 percent centimeter. Now, using this kind of information, the relative position of markers, so markers are basically bits of, of DNA, then we can build, even before we know much about it, you know, genetic maps. It's also called Lynch linkage maps. And, and in this case, you, you, you have to have is the order of markers in the chromosomes. Uh, you know, so they will be positioned, and, and they, they are identified on the basis of recombination. You also have other kinds of maps, so-called physical maps. And this is the real position of the genes or the markers. You know, how, how, how many nucleotides or whatever are separated, and they're at their relative position. And the way to, to get this, there are many different ways, but nowadays the easiest one is just sequence the genome. You just sequence and you get the whole, the whole thing. You get the list. So the two kinds of maps are important for our purpose. Um, now, what markers are? What kind of markers? Let's well, say bits of DNA, but they have to have some properties. One property has to this variation. They have to, to, to vary and, and, of course, be subject to uh, to this genetic recombination. So there are some examples here of markers. Uh, some of them are older than others, uh, or more used nowadays than others. So these are the randomly amplified polymorphic restriction fragment amplified microsatellites uh, and SNPs. I'll just go quickly through each one of them. So this is a, a type of marker where it's called restriction fragment length polymorphism. 
The restriction fragment is the following. If you have an enzyme that cuts DNA in two parts, that's a restriction part, fragment. So it's an enzyme that cuts. In fact, there are many enzymes called nucleases that cut the DNA in different ways. So they are characteristic, both in terms of frequency in the DNA where they can cut, because they have to recognize specific sequences of the DNA, or uh, in the kind of cut that they produce. So they can be very different. So one way is just, you, you know, because you've got all these enzymes, you can cut them, and you get these restriction fragments with the different sizes and so on. And then you can overlap them and, and, and get a structure of, of the DNA, a, a map. You also have amplified fragment length polymorphism. This is another step from there. Sorry? That's okay. <laughs> uh, amplified fragment length polymorphism. It's basically the same thing, but we make a, 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 a modification where we ligate some artificial adapters, and then we use PCR, so we amplify. Before we didn't do that, now we amplify. But you can see the idea. These are amplified by enzymes. These are amplified by PCR using some uh, random primers and so on. But you can see, imagine what, what this means. So it means that you can identify bits of DNA that have specific properties and vary. Now, m the more, probably the most used nowadays are, amongst the most used, are microsatellites also called single, single uh, sequence, uh, simple sequence repeats. It's a bit like this. In the DNA, uh, so if this side and this side are identical here, compared to these ones, but there are repeats. You know, that means the same nucleotide several times, and the length and the type of repeats can vary. And so you can use this as a marker. It's very specific for each individual. And of course, it's just simple mutations, like I mentioned before. These are also markers. It's called simple, single nucleotide polymorphisms and can be used also as markers. In fact, nowadays, these are the most interesting for people. So, what, well, I don't know if you can see here, but probably not so well, but you'll see more later on because it's going to be shown. Uh, in this case, you have a, a linkage map of the CBAS. These are, each one of these here are markers, mostly microsatellites, and this is the relative distance in a chromosome. This is the one chromosome, that's another one, which is called the linkage group, but it corresponds to a chromosome. And so there are several here. And, and look, on this side is actually the actual physical map of the C bus. In green is the bit of sequence already, in fact, now it's more than this. And in red, it's bits that are still missing. Uh, in this case, what is presented here are the chromosomes of the stickleback. I don't know if you know what a stickleback, small fish. It's also a model fish. Uh, it has these 21 chromosomes. And what you can see is that the, there is a correspondence between the sea bass chromosomes and it's not identical, and, and the stickleback. So this is an, another aspect. It's when we have many genomes, we can start comparing them. And, and in fact, this is quite an important aspect, uh, as I will mention in my last slide, because by learning from one species, in some cases, you can extrapolate to another species. So nowadays, where this idea of new species, you know, uh, for aquaculture. So if we know a lot about sea bass, maybe with that sea information, we can also apply it to bigger or some other species like that. So that's another uh, interesting aspect. <laughs> so how do you then use this kind of information that we've been talking about? As you can see, we're, we're building up. Uh, well, it's genetics, and we try to link genotype with phenotype. We, we want fish to grow faster, so we have to find, find out in the genome what makes that fish go faster. Where is it? What's, where is this marker, this characteristic? Then we can use both you know, those maps 
uh, and, and identify the so-called quantitative trade loss rate for workers. Uh, that is the uh, particular region of the chromosome which is linked to, for example, growth. Of course, this region has to be polymorphic. It means that you know, there are some individuals that have one kind of allele, others have another. And it must be linked to a polymorphic marker, like the ones I showed you in the previous slide. So, for example, uh, the, low, the gene that is responsible for more growth could be right here next to this marker. As you remember before, if they are very close together, there is no recombination. So when the marker moves around, the gene moves around. And so we can follow it. It's a marker. That's why I call it a marker. And this is the example of what I just said. So you have, like a bit of DNA, two markers, M1 with alleles, because they are variable, and the gene of interest. If there is crossing over, of course, this one changes because a recombination, this is the combination here, but the gene and this marker are always together. And we can follow and see which individuals grow faster and have that marker. And by counting the number of individuals that have that marker, we can arrive to that conclusion. So, how does it work in general terms? This is how it follows. The general strategy is always the same. There are variations, but this is the principle. First, we have to select to identify the QPL, so the, 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 these uh, regions. We have to select parents that differ for the trait. That means we have to have some parents that grow faster, some that grow not so fast, so we can compare them. We have to screen the parents for polymorph, polymorphic marker loss. If we have the map, like I mentioned before, we can select which ones, which markers to use. We have to generate uh, recombinant in red lines, and we have to screen then the animals for the phenotype growth, for example, uh, and, then, and then we genotype those animals, and we have to contrast for each position of the marker um, the numbers or frequency of individuals that have that marker. So, in, in terms of graphical terms, so this is the, the trait now, we see two populations which are divergent, we cross them, and then we have individuals with, because of recombination, they uh, have that particular marker. And here, for each marker, which is this little triangles here, this is where the markers are, we look for each marker, what's the percentage of individuals that have it. If they have it, and it's a particular, you know, it's growth, like I mentioned before, that means there is a, a high frequency individual with that particular marker. In some cases, it's 50-50, you know, because there is no effect. And so on. And so we are, can identify which markers are linked to that particular trait. So this is the QTL. And this is really the basis for selective breeding, breeding by marker assisted selection. And this is what can quickly uh, make you select individuals for particular traits. One trait or several traits, depending on uh, uh, what is the interest. It has to be defined what is your interest. So this is an example. They'll be, you know, basically the same thing. We need the families. We, we need the phenotype that we are interested in. Could be shape or whatever it is. We need the markers, the phenotype, the genotype, so the, the maps. And then we can analyze the QTL. Same thing. Now, really, CBAS, yes, there are QTLs for CBAS already found. Quite a few. Uh, others could be, could, could be found. In this case, what I just want in fact to show you, apart from repeating what we saw before, is that because we know the region where the QTL is, this region, and we have the actual genome sequence, and it's this region here in the genome, so we know the sequence, we also know what genes may be responsible. And with time, and, that, and, and, and a bit of work, we probably can identify which gene is responsible. That means which gene, which protein could be, for example, growth hormone. You know, and then we can identify why why that particular growth hormone is more active or whatever. So, this is the, the thing: is that it's a way, not only of, even without detailed information, it can be put into practice, but also we can use this information and go in, zoom in, and identify exactly what gene is causing it. 
And when we know that, let us see that the, uh, uh, the windows may open on how to use this information. I'll just mention another uh, kind of uh, approach that is now uh, very much used, particularly with human disease, uh, which is called genome-wide decision studies. This is more important because why? Because now sequencing is cheap, relatively cheap. And so that means we can do this even in fish without much problem. Uh, so these genome-wide decision studies are, it's an approach which involves rapidly scanning markers across the genome. So these markers are SNPs, plus just one mutation. We can use those uh, in many individuals to find genetic variations associated with a particular trait. So we need a large number of individuals. Why? Because uh, you know the, the, the many of these uh, effects, like growth, is not caused by one gene. It may be caused by several genes. So the variation is divided. So we need to get a strong signal. To get that signal stronger, we need to have many individuals. But this is the idea. So just as you can see here, this is one individual, one individual, one individual. This is a, 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 another group of individuals. This is one group. In this case, they have this particular mutation in the control group. And this one, for example, is the ones that grow faster. So all of them have it. So we can identify which ones have it and what is the basis for it. Again, we can potentially identify what is the gene involved so that we know more about it. Uh, how can this be done? Uh, without going too much detail, I'll just give you uh, an idea. Uh, this is just an example. There are many different ways of doing it. You saw before, one way of, using, of, of obtaining markers is to use enzymes to get the DNA. If we do that, we get the DNA, we put some adapters, we amplify with PCR, and we sequence. We don't need to have all the genome, we just select bits of the genome. And we can scan the whole genome, and then look at the sequences, and find these mutations. So this is how we can get them. Uh, and uh, without going into this, is just you can see that the mutations in some individuals. So each one of these is an individual. You can see the T and, and, and the A's in the others. So, uh, that, so that's one way. So what I'm my message, as you can see, is this one. We can actually zoom in the genome with sequencing is becoming very cheap. And that means that we can then apply these techno genetic technologies or techniques like uh, market assisted selection to then select individuals according to the profile we want. So the, the, the genome sequencing or well, sequencing is becoming cheap. Okay, I'll just quickly go through some of these machines and, and the principle of sequencing. I think this is also interesting because the information you have some of you may not know what it is. But remember that DNA build grows by adding nucleotides. And nucleotides have phosphate, and then they have the sugar and the base. And the way it, it happens is that this phosphate is going to bind here, and you lose two, two, there are three phosphates here, loses those two of these, and keeps adding. So this is the normal way. But if you modify this nucleotide by adding something else. In this case, uh, it's a, a beta group. This stops. And based on this, this gentleman, Frederick Sanger, which already got two Nobel Prizes, just himself, uh, uh, discovered how to sequence uh, DNA quite a long time ago. You know, in the, I think it was either the end of the 50s or beginning of the 60s. Uh, so this is the traditional way of doing it. But the problem with this approach is that you do one by one. It's, 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 very, it's very accurate, so you get very good quality, but it's very slow. Uh, you can improve this instead of doing the one by one case, which is the other, so this is one the example you got here. So every time you have, you have one of those modified bases, it gives a different color. And so you get, for each base, you have four colors, of course, you get the sequence, is that you can use like an array where you can do several at the same time. 
So this new generation sequencing, which is a, another keyword, which is the new machines, uh, some of them base, are based on this model. In fact, they tend to be based on this kind of approach. What it means you can sequence many samples at the same time. So let's, again, terminology. Next generation sequencing. This is something you hear and read everywhere. So first generation sequencing was, was what we saw before. That was standard sequencing. Second generation sequencing, you amplify the template molecules prior to sequencing. That means you have to do PCR. If that molecule, you have to do PCR, amplify, and then sequence. The third generation sequencing, you directly sequence the individual molecules. You don't have to do this you know, amplification. So that's the difference. But now let's look at the statistics. So this is a complex uh, graph, but I'll show you what it means. So on this side, you have disk storage, megabytes per dollar. How much it costs per dollar? Disk storage, you know, computer, average. In this side, uh, you have DNA sequencing, base pairs per dollar. How many base pairs? You can sequence per dollar. And this, of course, is the, is the years until now. Um, Pre-new generation sequencing. This is the rate of growth, right? You would be here now. But new generation sequencing came along here. And you can see that the production of data and the cost of sequencing per dollar is much, much lower. That means you can produce many more sequences per dollar. This is 100 million per one dollar. The problem is you are now generating a lot more data that you can store. So this is the old story of computing that you know. Moore's law, processor development, and so on. We follow the same thing. In fact, the technology is very much the same. The latest sequences using use silicon chips like computers. That's how it works. But we're not going to do those details. I'll just show you quickly how it works. So these are some of the problems that we have. And as you can imagine, with this kind of amount of data, analyzing, you know, imagine your fish farm, and we go and do one of those screens, um, and we have to take two thousand fish, each individual one left to have their genome sequence. Not the full, but let's say 30% or 20% of the data. We generate a lot of data. This requires computing power, requires storage of this information, because you know, what all the have the sequences there. Okay, it's not at the moment, it's possible, and it's done. That's what people do every day. But as more and more uh, is produced, more difficult it is. On the other hand, as you know, technology is developing, and tomorrow we may have another leap in into this problem. But it's just a curiosity that I thought you would probably be interested to know. Now let's just, I'll just give you the three or four concepts of sequences of the new generation that are being used nowadays. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it's not too difficult after you what you've heard to understand how they work. So this is one of the first ones that appear. It's called the 454 virus sequencing. And as this, this is a second generation, that means it has to be amplified. The way it does is by creating a cloud of oil, and then this bead has the DNA attached. Each cloud of oil is what one type of DNA, like from one individual. And then the enzyme required for the PCR is here as well as the, the other bits. And so there is a PCR going on inside called emotional PCR, which amplifies DNA. This is inside uh, a plate with all these very, very small holes where just one of these fit in. You cannot have more than one. So let's make sure there is no cross-contamination. And then you sequence this. Uh, so the way it works is when, when DNA is produced, like I mentioned before, there are two phosphates that come out. And then these phosphates are going to be used to produce ATP. Everyone knows ATP is uh, the energy molecule. And this ATP is used for luciferase, an enzyme, to produce light. So what you get is light. And light, of course, is photographed. 
And if you have two sequences, like here on the, in the red, or in the case, this is six of them. Six identical sequences, one, uh, sorry, nucleotides, one after the other, the amount of light produced is much higher. That means they are one after the other, and so on. I can explain a bit more detail if you want later, but otherwise it will take a long time. But you just see, you can see, this is basically light. Uh, What's, what is the big advantage of this? Is that you have many samples that you can imagine, different kinds of DNA there, which is a fragment of DNA from the genome. Um, then how is it all put together? Because what you have to do first, you have to, to break the DNA, then you have to put it together. The way you put it together is because when you break it randomly, some bits overlap, then the computers can just try to get everything stitched up and all together. So we build up the genome based on fragments. And this, in fact, this is how most of them work. What this machine has in particular is that it can produce long, relatively long sequences so that it's easier to put them together. That's basically it. Uh, so this is what it looks like and some properties, but I'll come back to this later on. Another variation is that instead of having that droplet of oil with the PCR, you can have a base, stick the DNA molecules, amplify them like this, and with another kind of reaction, you also get light condition, and you can photograph them, and you can get the sequences out. So it's a simple, it's more or less the same idea. So this is the so-called Illumina machine. One of the latest ones is the ISEC 2000. There are now others developing. <coughs> Look. And like the other one, the, 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 the fragments, the other one people produce nowadays fragments about 600 bases. This one, which is about 100 bases, it's growing but slowly. So it's more difficult to put them together, but produces much more signals, massive amounts of signals. In fact, it's one of the most used machines nowadays is this one, this ISEC 2000. Another one that is uh, very, uh, it's also uh, very much used. It's a solid machine. And it's a slightly different method. Instead of using the PCR ligation, it uses, instead of using the, the polymerase reaction, it uses ligation. It adds two nucleotides at the same time. Uh, it's a very complex uh, way to, to understand it at the beginning, so I'm not going to waste much time. But it's the same idea. You then get uh, images. Uh, which you have, you can build from those images the the sequence. Um, it also produces relatively small sequences, like the, the luminous uh, sequence here, but it can produce massive amounts. These are the two machines which produce more data nowadays. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, you know, big differences between them is how long it takes. For example, the Illumina can take several days to sequence on some. Uh, and the same one goes for this. Now, one of the most, one of the more recent ones, and this is not, not all of them, I'll show a table later, uh, is the ion term. So this one is one of those third generation. That means it sequences directly on chips. This is what it looks like. It's very, you know, kind of several layers. And when you have the reaction, the polymerase reaction, and the nucleotide, there is a proton that is released. So when you have protons in the, in the solution, it becomes more acidic. So if you have a pH sensor in the chip, you know when it was added to the nucleotide. And because you are adding nucleotides one at a time, so one type of the time, you know when it binds and when it doesn't, when it aggregates and when it doesn't. And so you, you build the sequence like that. One advantage, of course, you can build very long, uh, potentially very long uh, sequences. Uh, it's still more expensive to produce than the previous one, but it's going to be, I think, an, in, uh, an interesting one in the future. But I say, now this one is, doesn't mean any PCR. That means possibility of error is also decreased uh, in the sequencing. Okay, so I'm going to get into the end. Um, you, 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 you question yourself, you know, so we're talking about cheaper, more expensive. How much is that? Uh, before going into into those and uh, maybe just I like these are this is from a, a, a paper that came out last year that was analyzed 
know, all these sequences and all advantage and disadvantage and so on. Uh, but the data, the actual tables are from data from this year, the numbers that I'm going to give you. It's the current ideas. So for example, it can be applied, this sequence, to the novo assembly. That means if you have a species, you don't have no information, you can just put the DNA sequence and try to get information from that. This is what they mean. So there are different uh, aspects. I just want to, to, to look at this. Is the age where where are age? It means very good for that. So, for example, uh, this is DNA of microbes and fragments of DNA from, for example, uh, fish or whatever. Uh, the four five four is quite good for this. The, 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 the that one I should be first. Uh, but for example, there's others that have new other machines that I didn't mention. For example, these ones uh, for transcriptome. That means the RNA. You get here, you know, the ISEC 2000, I mentioned to you, but it's lots of data, and so on. There's plant and animal genomes, like we mentioned, again, the ISEC machine, very good. Uh, Resequencing applications, you, could, you end up with the same machines, more or less. Uh, very good for that kind of application. At the moment, it can be, for next year, it could be different, uh, and so on. So let's go through the numbers. Uh, numbers. So, this is <coughs> ordered, so this is, uh, sorry, this is the cost of the instruments. Uh, they are quite expensive, you can see, many of them. The ISEC 2000, what is it here, uh, costs about $700,000. Uh, so they are expensive machines. It's not something that you have in a fish farm, that's not the idea. In fact, you know, you, even most labs don't have them. It's just, uh, I just send, you know, many of us will send it to a company that has this. Uh, computational resources, like I mentioned before, it's needed. So this also has costs uh, involved, but we don't care. No, I missed one. There's one slide that I jumped. I have to go back. Oh. Uh -oh. The key one, I have here the cost of sequencing. I seem to have disappeared. I'll, I'll just quickly switch to your account. Okay? Switch to your account. I'll switch to my presentation. Sorry about this, but I thought that this is important for me. At least to have some idea. Okay, so this is just more for your information. So the middle, uh, so this is the cost per run, cost per mega, mega basis, so that's one million basis. Um, well, we'll leave that one. So this is ordered in this way. So this kind of machine, this is the old machines, you know, like the, the first, the, the sample ones. So if you want to sequence one million bases, you pay $2,500 more or less in reagents. Now compare this to the ISEC. You pay four cents for one million bases. So if we think about a thousand times more, that's enough to sequence a genome, roughly. Uh, so it's really becoming cheaper. And it's going cheaper, like uh, fast, you know, according to those lines, very quickly. Um, so this, I think this is a, a number that, that is just. Of course, I'm not saying that each individual farm is going to sequence or whatever, that's not the idea. But it's, it's it, we can think that, ah, if maybe we get together or whatever, uh, this can be done, you know, these technologies can be applied. Of course, uh, in this session. And I think I will 
uh, just finish here. This is just to show you this, what I mentioned at some point. If you think of what you have here, it's different animals, from fish to dog, and this is a comparison to you. So this is a sequence, part of a sequence, of a gene called Pax2. And the more lines you have, the more similar it is to the human. What you can see is, of course, as you expect, the fish are not so similar to the human in this gene. But there are some common aspects. And if you compare, if you were, if you were going to have fish between themselves, you will find many things in common. But here, what I want to show you is this. Uh, in fact, dog is so similar to human that we can use dog or whatever, some other fish. So we can say here, we can, it doesn't mean that it's like this in all cases, but the, for the important functions, quite often uh, they are conserved and they can be used. So while there is some development work that can be done in some cases, there is also information that can be used from one species to the other. And that's for me what I have to say at the moment, and it's my summary. So many applications, directly or indirectly derived from omics advances are available that can boost our culture. This is our view. Uh, and it's yours because you are here as well. Sequencing technologies are now cheap enough to unleash the power of genomics and apply them realistically to even novel species. And the challenge is how to transfer technology from laboratory to companies. How do you do it? Do we get, you know, service companies? entrepreneurs, someone to put the technology available so that then each individual farmer can decide what's best for them. That's the, 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 really the, the key question. Thank, Thank you. If you have questions on this first presentation, it's important to have them now. Quick question. If I understand correctly, the one the one set of challenges is actually decoding the the gene sequences for various species and identifying which particular characteristics are represented where. But is it not uh, more complicated, let's say, that it's not a simple co correlation between a specific marker appearing and a trait. It, it could be a combination mm -hmm. of markers. And um, there's an additional difficulty if one starts to try to select for many, more than one trait. Is that, is that not really the real challenge? Uh, because we yes. sequence the genome. Okay, but, but I think this is a progressive thing. Like, mm -hmm. for example, okay. uh, you have multifactorial traits, you know, uh, traits is dependent on many genes. Mm -hmm. If you discover one QTR, that next to your gene for growth, there is another gene for susceptibility to another virus. <coughs> so you are getting the fish to grow faster, but at the same time, they are more susceptible to disease. So this is, this is what really is that I think this is the challenge in a selection program is to get the balance so that you get the benefit uh, eventually. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go now to Costas Patagas. And